So how can we describe patterns? First of all, a pattern needs to have a name. This is important to have this common vocabulary. We need a catchy name for a pattern. So, uh, of course, you could name pattern some funny, some, uh, some, some arbitrary names and titles, but actually it should be used during, during real language. If two people are uh, talking to each other and they say the pattern name, it should be easy to use. It should be normal to use. It should be obvious to use. Then the context. The context is important because different contexts could make uh, or could demand different solutions. For example, are we developing on a on a PC, on a on a desktop computer, or are we developing or are we implementing some stuff for an embedded device? Embedded devices have much lower computing power, have much less memory, so. Um, we should, th these are different constraints and different forces which, um, which need for different solutions. But the problems can be everywhere. So um, my application is slow, can be a problem on embedded devices as well as personal computers. But the, the limitations are completely different. The constraints are completely different. And these constraints, these things which make the problem hard to solve, are actually described in the forces. So the problem describes that something isn't uh, right or something isn't as I expected it to be. And the forces describe why is this a problem? Why is this difficult? So why does the problem hurt in this context? And maybe in another context it doesn't hurt. It's no problem. For example, um, uh, I, I'm, my application is slow, then yeah, buy a faster CPU or a faster graphics card. In some contexts, it's, it's easy to solve. In other problems, you can't buy better hardware. You have to solve it somehow else. And this is described in the forces what, um, what, what actually are the challenges in this problem, because easy problems you could solve right away. Then the solution is a gen generic or general description of the core idea of the solution. It mostly consists of static structures, so which components are part of this pattern, and dynamic behavior, so how they are working each other, how, how is one class calling, or how, how is one object calling another object, and maybe also actionable steps. So how can I implement this pattern? And then there are always consequences, but they are called somehow differently in depending on which pattern format you use. Sometimes they're called rational, sometimes they're called the resulting context, but what they describe are what are the benefits and drawbacks. So after applying the pattern, um, what are the things which still aren't solved? Or are there some new problems which I should care about? What are my liabilities? What are the limitations and trade-offs by using this pattern? Sometimes I have, uh, after applying a pattern, I have a very flexible software architecture, but the software is really, really slow and is very complicated to read. So for example, for a Hello World application, it doesn't make sense to use design patterns. Maybe Hello World itself is a pattern. But yeah, don't make it more complicated than it has to be. And in the consequences, very often is described how the forces are resolved. So how the, the challenges and requirements are actually resolved by using this pattern. And what also should be always there are known uses, so real life examples of using this pattern. Okay, to remember this in an easy way, I came up with, a, with the pattern house. Um, so you can see the name of the pattern, you have to call the house somehow. So there should be a catchy name. The context is the roof, which is above all other stuff. And there is this problem, forces, which belong together, and the solution and the consequences, which belong together. 
And this all stands on top of the known uses because they really define that this was this is actually a pattern, a proven solution in many, many use cases. There are also different uh, formats how you can write this. But actually, if you look back at the old book by Christopher Alexander, you have the same parts there, just written differently, not that explicit. So you have the name of a pattern. So this is an, an excerpt from the book. It's about the bus stop. Uh, so every pattern has a name. Every pattern has, in this case, a picture or some, uh, for software, it could be a diagram. It has a context. It has problem forces in, in for Alexandrian pattern format. He mixed it up. So he described the problem and the forces in, in one single chapter. Then you have the solution and the consequences and also some, some drawing. For example, here on the bottom of this green um, box, you have a drawing how a bus stop could look like. You have some examples. And in an Alexandrian format, you also have this related pattern and epilogue. So um, he tried to connect different patterns to each other. And this makes a pattern language, actually. So this is the part in the book which um, establishes a pattern language. So as you can see, he wrote different, differently. And if you look into uh, uh, another pattern book, there are several out there. Um, all the parts will be called a little bit differently, but they are always there. So the name, the context, the problem and the forces, the solution and the consequences, and the known uses. Um, in this case, he states the known uses by doing some, uh, showing some pictures of actual bus stops. And also for architecture, it is more obvious because we have seen the known uses already. Many of us have seen yeah, most of, of these patterns, like stairs. You don't have to bring the argument uh, that this is, this is already applied over and over again. But in software development, we may not have seen every solution and every real-life example. 